The first lesson is taken from the second chapter of Ezekiel. A voice said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Here ends the first lesson. We will now read Psalm 123 responsibly. To you I lift up my eyes to you enthroned in the heavens. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he shows us his mercy. Too much of the scorn of the indolent rich, indolent, indolent rich, rich, and of the derision of the proud. We will now read um, the second lesson taken from the twelfth chapter of Second Corinthians. I know a person in Christ who, fourteen years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in, in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told and that no mortal is permitted, permit, permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except for my weaknesses. But I, if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me. Even considering the exceptional character of the revelations, therefore to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution. Persecutions and calamities for the sake of Christ, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Um, here ends the second lesson. If you are able, please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. 
He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Congregation may be seated. I'll invite the children down for a moment. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you? Wow, Molly, haven't seen you in a long time. Or Ryan, give you guys a quick, quick high five. Do you mind to stand up for one second? I can see how much she has, and Ryan too, have grown <laughs> before she was like here. So, all right, you won the award for have grown the most of uh, all the kids. So, and don't tell me. Just tell me the first letter. E. Oh, you have to remind me. Emma, okay. So we're gonna say one, two, three, God loves Emma. Is everybody ready? One, two, three. God loves Emma. And uh, welcome and glad to have you with us. So um, this morning we heard a story about the disciples um, that Jesus sent them out on a journey. And I'm just curious, have you all traveled this summer or gone on any vacations? Where'd you go? New York City? Wasn't that the commercial? <laughs> How'd you like it? All right, did they win? Okay, all right. are you a Yankees fan? Oh, I am, all right. All right, I still like it. Nathan wants to watch a Giants game. Who else traveled this summer? Who else traveled somewhere? You went to Florida for two weeks, that's great. Anyone else? Florida? Yeah, you went to Florida, I think. Anyone else? I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to, go to Delaware and my uncle Oh, cool. That sounds like fun. Yeah, that's hey, great. I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to see your cousins? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's okay. So Virginia is nice. That's a good place. So yeah. Well, the reason I ask is, I mean, did you bring a lot of stuff when you traveled? Like, what kinds of things did you bring? Some clothes, food, some stuff that you need. Maybe some toys. Maybe you, did you bring your baseball glove when you went to the game? Catch a foul ball. Well, in the story this morning. Jesus sent out the apostles, the disciples, to go to the towns, and they took almost nothing with them. All they took was like a staff to walk. And I'm wondering, you know, compared to us, when it takes like three hours to load the car just to go down to Virginia or Delaware, why do you think Jesus sent them out with so few things? And so they could get there faster? Yeah, probably. What else? I mean, who are they going to rely on when they didn't have anything? God? Yeah. Maybe their neighbors? Mm -hmm. Mother Nature? <laughs> it could be. Yeah, I think, I think Brady is exactly right. I mean, I think the reason that they took so few things with them was so that they could learn to, to trust God, that God would provide for them, and also that they could receive the hospitality of the communities that they went to serve. You know, so sometimes I think we are so focused on having the latest and greatest stuff uh, that we forget to be grateful for all the things that God has already given us. You know, we forget to trust that God will provide for all of our needs. 
So perhaps like the disciples, we need to sometimes just think about having the, the bare minimum of what we need and, and trust that God will provide for the rest. So let's, let's say a quick prayer together, boys and girls. Uh, dear God, I thank you for these children, um, for the ways that they have grown um, spiritually and intellectually and physically over the last year. Um, I thank you for their journeys and uh, vacations with their families this summer. Um, I thank you they were able to join us for Vacation Bible School. Help us, like the disciples, to learn to trust in you, to provide for all of our needs today and every day. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. You can have a seat. <laughs> Well, today uh, is kind of a special day, obviously, because it's not every year that Independence Day falls on a Sunday. I think it's been probably, you know, five, six years uh, since the last time it happened. So I'm going to tie everything together. I'm going to come back to Mark chapter 6. But if you're looking for a sermon on just Mark chapter 6, you're going to be a little bit disappointed. But uh, I'll try to, to bring it all together. But... Um, of course, as I mentioned before, we did have Vacation Bible School this past week, and I'll ask some of our children, who is, who is the person we talked about most this past week? Anyone remember? Moses. And we talked about the story of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt, um, out from you know, their 400 years that they spent working as slaves for Pharaoh, um, and then Moses... Um, being raised up by God to deliver the people um, and, and to lead them out of Egypt into the promised land. And um, what a great story. I hadn't, hadn't really, you know, read that passage of, of Exodus um, lately, but, you know, just, it was so neat to see the children learning this, this such important story. I mean, some people call that incident or that, that episode the cross of the Old Testament. You know, the, the Exodus from Egypt and and the covenant on Mount Sinai and all these things. And, um, but I was thinking this week about, you know, some of the similarities uh, between what the Israelites experienced and what we are experiencing now, today. And the reason for this is, one of my professors in seminary used to say that people always misunderstand the story of the Exodus as a story of slavery, to freedom, right? Going from slavery to freedom. And really, he said, it's a story about going from, from servitude to servitude, that the people, the Israelites, were no longer there to serve Pharaoh, but they were now there to serve God, to be God's servants in the world, and to be the light that would, you know, shine on the hill to, to enlighten all the nations of the world. So it's not so much that they left Egypt and then decided to go party and, and, and be their own people and be free forever, right? They, were, they entered into an agreement with God uh, that, that the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be their God and they would be God's people. Um, and in doing so, they would, they would keep the covenant, they would, they would follow God's commandments um, and, and teach the whole world about God's love and, and forgiveness and mercy, and of course, uh, it wasn't easy. You know, they struggled with this. And after, right after they got out of Egypt, you remember what happens? They got to, they got to Mount Sinai. <laughs> they had, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> they got out, they, they crossed the Red Sea, and then uh, they had one job to do. Uh, Moses got called up on the mountain, and Moses is like, all right, I'll be back in a few days. Whatever you do, don't worship any other gods while I'm gone. And what did they do? They built a golden calf, right? And uh, immediately, they kind of fell short of that goal. But, I mean, throughout the, throughout the Bible, the Israelites struggle with this, of how to be God's people in the world. How do they be God's people when they are completely surrounded by nations that worship other gods, nations that have different priorities, um, who have different practices, and 
Of course, later on, it gets even more difficult as their kingdom, their nation is conquered uh, by the Babylonians and they're taken into exile. And how do they remain faithful to God? How do they remain as God's people even when they are living in a foreign land? Um, and so this is the challenge that they, that they face. And I think for us today, um, even though we certainly live um, in a nation in which we are free, in which we enjoy a great amount of freedom, um, we struggle with the same question of how do we best be Christians in this nation? Um, how do we best serve God in this nation where we can so often do as we please and do as we wish? You know, we Americans, we're, we love our freedom, um, and I love it as much as, as the next guy. We're not as good about talking about our responsibilities and what it means to be a good citizen. Um, you know, you have a lot of people who tell you, well, I pay my taxes uh, and I vote, and that's great, but that's, that's, that's about the bare minimum, right, of what it means to be a good citizen in this, in this country. I mean, if you show up at the polls once every two years or once a year and cast your ballot, if you pay your taxes on time, that's great. We should all do that. But that's, that's about the lowest thing you can do to be kind of a good citizen in this country. And living in a democracy is hard. It takes a lot of work. I mean, we have to be very knowledgeable about our legislators, our elected and appointed officials, the legislation they're passing. Um, it, it takes quite a bit of compromise. You know, we don't all get what we want. That's what they say democracy is. Everyone gets what no one wants, <laughs> right? So it's, it's tough. And as Christians living in a democratic nation, we sometimes have to figure out what it means to be followers of Jesus. Uh, Martin Luther once wrote a, a treatise um, called On Christian Freedom. And he kind of held up this, these paradoxical ideas that a, he said a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. Christians don't have to answer to anyone because we're subject to no one but God. But then he also said that Christians are perfectly dutiful servants, subject to all, subject to everybody. Right? We have to help all of our neighbors, whether we like them or not, if we're, if we're going to call ourselves Christians. And boy, is that tough. Um, so on this 4th of July, um, I invite all of us to think about what it means to be not only a good citizen of this great nation, but also a good neighbor. Um, thinking about Back in the days of the American Revolution, you know, most of us tend to remember from, you know, seventh grade history class, some of the highlights of, of uh, our war for independence with, with Great Britain. But, you know, we were very lucky. <laughs> we, we almost did not win that war because at the time we were 13 colonies and Congress had very little power to compel any of the states to do anything to help any of the other states. So most of the states were looking out only for their own self-interest. You know, if, if the British were, were, were in Virginia, someone would say, we're not sending our, our troops to Virginia. <laughs> you know, that's, that's their problem. Let them deal with it. Um, and we, we were very, had a lot of trouble. I mean, if it was not for either the providence of God or for, or for good luck, um, we, we could have, the outcome of that war could have been very different. And even more so, we like to think that all Americans were, were on the same page. But the fact is, many, many Americans, um, they wanted to remain loyal to the, to the British crown. A lot of people did not want to form a new country. They were... They were loyal subjects to the King of England. And after the war was over, you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans left and went to live in Canada or elsewhere in the New World because they felt there was no longer a home for them here in this new nation. So why do I mention all this? Um, again, I think the question for today, I know most of us here are preparing to enjoy a nice cookout 
or spend some time with the family and celebrate all those freedoms and celebrate the, the great nation in which we live. But what will it be for us tomorrow on July 5th? What will it be for us on July 6th and for the rest of this year? We know that right now we're going through one of those cycles where our country is very divided. Um, I was not alive during the Vietnam War, but from what some of the older folks have told me, it reminds them of those years um, in, which, in which people are so divided and uh, so skeptical about what it means to be an American, about what it means to be a member of this community. And so I think for all of us, what I would invite us to do as, as Christians in this nation is to think about how can I be someone who builds bridges? How can I be someone who offers grace and love and forgiveness to my neighbors? And this is where I'm gonna tie it to the end of uh, bringing it back to the gospel reading that we heard from today. But Jesus sent out the disciples, right? He sent them out two by two. <laughs> he didn't do it all himself. He needed his disciples to go out into the world to share the good news, uh, to, as the scripture tells us, to, to cast out the demons and to anoint with oil those who are sick and to cure them. And I think that's what God is doing with us. You know, he's not sending us um, you know, necessarily out with, with nothing in our, but the clothes on our backs. But um, so many people in our communities, sorry, so many people in our communities, not only do they not know about the good news of Jesus, but they feel isolated, uh, they feel alone. And I think this day God is using each one of us here, each one of us in this place, uh, to be those ones who go out, um, helping to bring healing, not only to our nation, uh, but to, to our neighbors and to each other. So brothers and sisters, I'll leave it there.